Dioscorides and other Greek physicians who lived 2,000 years ago. Dioscorides' book, De Materia Medica, was widely distributed and copied by hand over and over for centuries. This is a page from the oldest known copy from the year 512. This is a much later version of the same herbal. In this one, the copyist decided to put the drawings in the margins. The first illustrated herbal to be printed in the Western world was by another Greek, Apuleius Platonicus, and it was originally written in year nine of the Common Era. Although a printed herbal was wonderful for sharing the knowledge about medicinal plants, the illustrations were crude and inaccurate because they were based on images, repeatedly copied by hand, century after century, errors and all. You can see for yourself why the tradition evolved to leave out the illustrations and herbals. This diagram is completely useless for identification. <laughs> so, why did a famous physician decide it was time for a change in the middle of the 16th century? Because 200 years earlier, in 1346, there had been 80 million people in Europe. And in 1347, the Black Death arrived on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. In four short years, 50 million people died. And there was no cure, no treatment helped. All medical treatment at that time was completely plant-based, and most of it was done by monks, or priests, or the local friendly, <laughs> who collected herbs in the forest and made pints and poultices. <laughs> the Catholic Church condemned the pagan Greeks and Romans of antiquity on religious grounds and made it punishable by death either to read or possess any of the ancient writings. But when the all-powerful church was unable to cure or to stop the Black Death, Europeans began to think twice about that rule. This painting shows St. Sebastian up here in heaven uh, praying for the victims of the plague, while on earth, even the grave diggers were keeling over dead from the dreaded disease. Leonard Keeps, in 1535, was famous as a physician all over Europe and was a professor at a leading medical school in Germany. He had come to realize that educated men had little to no botanical knowledge, and he was appalled. He had thoroughly studied ancient Greek and Latin writings about the medical properties of plants, and he fervently wished to make that knowledge part of every physician's training. His plan was to write and illustrate a brand new textbook containing all the Greek and Latin knowledge, along with brand new illustrations of all the known medicinal plants in the world. He had the garden with the plants, so he hired two artists and a wood carver, and he got to work. He even put their images in the book, giving them credit for their hard work. Granted, you can see they're on the last page, but they're there. <laughs> he made a total of 511 images for the herbal. This first man, whoops, actually drew the plants. The second one, next to him, made a line drawing on the wooden blocks that were made from pear trees. And then this guy on the bottom, who's holding the carving devices, would carve the blocks in such a way that the image could be printed over and over on paper. And in 1542, the first edition in Latin was printed. In 1543, the German language version was printed. Let me read you the title of the book. In English, notable commentaries on the history of plants prepared with the greatest expense and diligence by Leonard Keeps, a physician by far the most distinguished in this our age, <laughs> and adorned with more than 500 lifelike pictures in imitation of nature, never hitherto drawn and printed with greater art. <laughs> Many others have visited foreign lands, some here, some there, at huge cost with tireless effort and sometimes not without peril to their lives, <laughs> in order to acquire intimate knowledge of the substance of simples. All this substance you will be pleased to learn from this book, 
had been a living pleasure garden at a great saving of money and time, far from any hell. Added to this is an abbreviated explanation of the difficult and obscure words that occur here and there in this work. Together with a fourfold index containing the Greek names of the plants, the Latin names, those used in the shops of druggists and by herb gatherers, and the German names. I don't think that title would fit into a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how he did with his illustration. I'm going to show you some old ones and how they were recopied and recopied, and then I'll show you the new one of the same plant in the new purple. This is the dragon plant, 6th century. 13th, 15th century, look at that. <laughs> Here's the new herbal. You really could identify the plant. Let's look at this one. Plantain, 6th century, 13th century, 15th. I don't know why the scorpion and the snake are in the picture. And the new herbal. Isn't that beautiful? Nymphia, 6th century, 13th, 15th, <laughs> <laughs> and this gorgeous, gorgeous woodcut in the new herbal. Isn't it interesting that this plant has such a long history? The archaeological record indicates that it's been used medically since at least 2500 BCE. And I don't know if anyone else thinks it's ironic that that site is in the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> this was a very, very popular book. First Latin, then German. And in 1545, he published just the images for those who couldn't read. The book was printed in 39 more editions before his death in 1566. He printed large folio editions like this one that's open to the chili pepper plant. And these weighed 11 pounds. He even got the team to redo all the woodcuts in much smaller versions so he could print pocket editions to take out in the field and collect the plants. And you can see that person's holding the book in one hand. This herbal was the first in Europe to contain plants from the Americas, like chili peppers, pumpkin, and corn. This is a very accurate drawing of maize, which we all know is a New World plant. Gibbs must have acquired seeds or a plant without knowing its origin. His label, Turkicum fermentum, means Turkish wheat. <laughs> and here is his description of the plant. This grain, like many others, is one of the varieties that have been brought to us from another plant. Moreover, it came into Germany from Greece and Asia. Whence it is called Turkish grain, since today far flung Turkey takes in almost all of Asia. The Germans, noting the place of its origin, call it Turkish corn. Now, why did this brilliant man make a mistake like this? Well, for centuries, anything foreign came to Europe from or through the Far East. When Europeans saw this unusual bird from the New World, it's believed that this came to be called Turkey for the same reason. It was foreign. It also vaguely resembles the guinea fowl, which was known in England as a turkey cock or a turkey hen because it had been imported to Europe from Eastern Africa through the Ottoman Empire, or Turkey. Now, the Turkish word for this bird is Hindi, which literally means Indian. The original word in French, coquin, meant rooster of India and has since been shortened to hen. These names likely derive from the common misconception that India and the New World were one and the same. In Portuguese, it's literally a Peru bird, and in Malay, it's called a Dutch chicken. But I digress. Let's get back to Leonard Fuchs. Today, authors hope to make the bestseller list, but in 1559, Leonard Fuchs made the Pope's list. His name was on the very first index of prohibited books. Uh -huh. Fuchs was a Protestant, therefore he made the list as a heretic cult. Within months of the first prohibition, Catholic readers and ecclesiastical officials alike realized that Fuchs' books were very important resources for physicians, 
despite their author's religion. Thus began a process of compromise that lasted for more than a century in Italy. With permission from church authorities, Catholic leaders were allowed to keep their copies of Fuchs's book if they removed his name from the text. <laughs> this copy was probably censored by an inquisitor who was in a hurry. He used a paintbrush to cross out Fuchs's name. This book owner rewrote Fuchs's name over the censor's mark. <laughs> it's a little hard to see today. And this book owner obliterated Fuchs's name by altering the letters and marks to resemble different letters. Many copies that have survived until today show evidence of this censorship. There were other reasons during the Renaissance to publish beautiful botanical drawings, however. In 1597, 30 years after Fuchs died, the wealthy bishop of Eichstätt, Germany, commissioned the first major European botanical garden outside of Italy. A visitor in 1611 described the palace as being surrounded by terraced gardens. And he wrote, each of the eight gardens contained flowers from a different country. They varied in the beds and flowers, especially in the beautiful roses, lilies, and tulips. There were tulips in 500 colors, almost all different. By 1648, the gardens were completely destroyed in the Thirty Years' War. But over 350 years later, in this very decade, these gardens have been recreated. And this is an actual photo of those gardens from 2012. It could not have been done without an amazing book, also commissioned by the bishop. Basilius Bessler was an apothecary, or what today we call a pharmacist. Basilius is the Latin form of his name, as you see in this portrait. He's holding a sprig of basil, which was his name in German. Mm -hmm. To do the gardens, the bishop first hired a man who was a physician and a botanist, but he died. Bessler took his place. Part of the job was to create the most fabulous garden ever seen containing nearly every plant known all over the whole world. But the bishop also wanted a book published that contained an image of every one of the plants in the garden. And a collection of plant images that are from a specific place or garden is called a flora legion. And Bessler's flora legion took 16 years to finish. Sadly, the bishop died after 15 years, but fortunately, he had made arrangements to pay for the publication of the book. This is the title page and one of the colored copies of the book. You do get the impression that Bessler set out to make the most amazing book of plant paintings ever done. This is also the dragon plant. And I think 60 years and new technology has made a big difference. Mm -hmm. Although Fortis Aestetensis is usually known by Bessler's name, his contribution was probably confined to what would be called project management today. He regulated finances and orchestrated the complicated work of the teams of artists and craftsmen. First, colored sketches of the 1,086 different flowers were made from life over a period of more than a year. Boxes of fresh cut flowers were sent every week from Eichstätt to Nuremberg, 50 miles to the north. As they were finished, the original color sketches were passed on to another workshop in another city. There they were translated into black and white drawings suitable for engraving. Then the black and white drawings went to another workshop in another city to be engraved onto copper plates. After being printed, the final stage for a luxury edition was the meticulous coloring by hand of all 367 printed plates. Nuremberg had several workshops specializing in book illumination of this kind. The first edition, published in 1613, was 300 copies, all hand colored. Legend has it that Bessler himself colored nearly 200 copies. He organized it by the season in which each plant bloomed. So there were seven winter plates, 134 spring, 184 summer, and 42 autumn. The Royal Mint of Munich was believed to have melted down all the copper plates in 1817. But recently, a 
over 300 of the original plates were found in Vienna. So, the colored copies cost 500 florins, which was a lot of money. Just to give you an idea, during that time, a really nice house would cost 2,500 florins. So five books, a whole house. Today, a single colored page can sell for thousands of dollars. Bessler's floor legion set the standard for centuries to come. Wealthy plant collectors still commission floor legions today, such as the High Hill floor legion and the Transylvania floor legion, both commissioned by Prince Charles. Botanical gardens also commission and publish floral legions today. And on top is the Hydro floral legion. Good news, copies are still available for 12,950 pounds. That's $18,000. And if this one's more in your budget, the floral legion of the Royal Botanic Gardens in Sydney, Australia is available for $65 in soft cover. It only came out a couple of years ago. It's a beautiful book. Now that we've talked about the two oldest pieces in the gallery, let's talk about the two women whose names are on the wall in there. Maria Sibylla Marion was a very unconventional 17th century woman. As a child of Frankfurt, Germany, she was completely absorbed in collecting and observing caterpillars and other insects, and she never grew out of it. She was raised to be a proper lady, she was taught to paint flowers and how to engrave copper plates because she grew up in the home of painters and printers and engravers. In her less ladylike moments, teenage Maria had collected silkworms off the mulberry trees in Frankfurt and kept them in boxes in her bedroom, observing them spin their cocoons and emerge as moths. As a girl of 13, this was her first sketchbook painting of them. Her stepfather was a famous painter, and he had taught Maria how to paint. But over the years, as she continued to study caterpillars, she realized that each caterpillar preferred particular plants as food, and she made detailed study drawings of everything in her sketchbook. Maria really tried to be a beautiful wife and mother. At age 18, she married one of her stepfather's art students. Her new husband was a printer and a painter and an engraver. She worked for the ladylike life. She became rather well known as a teacher of needlework to young ladies in Nuremberg. She published a book of floral patterns for her students. She did all the paintings, she engraved all the plates, and her husband published the book for her. It was quite successful and reprinted many times. <coughs> and this is the title page for one of her Blumen books and a sample of the patterns that would be inside that book. In 1669, Johannes Gubert published the first illustrated writings about insect metamorphosis. Maria would have been in her late teens or early 20s when this work came out, and she probably read it. And it confirmed what she had been observing for several years. His illustrations showed a small drawing of each stage of the insects. There was a vigorous scientific debate about his findings because most of the world believed that caterpillars just magically appeared out of cabbages, or flies spontaneously flew out of dead leaves. This is another drawing from her sketchbook. Maria continued to have boxes and boxes stacked in her home, full of caterpillars and larvae that she would carefully feed and observe as they pupated and emerged as adult butterflies, moths, or other insects. Her friends and neighbors would even knock on her door with a new bug for her to study. Ten years after Goodart's book, in 1679, she published the first volume of her own scientific study of the caterpillars of Northern Europe. The title in English was The Caterpillar's Marvelous Transformation and Strange Floral Food. It was a big hit for a couple of reasons. First, she published it in German, not Latin, so the affluent public could read it. The, the illustrations were amazing. She showed the life cycle of the insect on the plant with great skill and talent. In 1683, she published the second volume. Each book contained 161 pages 
and 51 full page engravings. She did every painting and every engraving herself. She wrote every word of the text. Then she hand colored copies herself to sell as deluxe editions. Now I'd love to talk more about her very interesting life, but in the interest of time, let's jump ahead 15 years. In 1599, this amazing citizen scientist at age 52 decided that she would sell 200 of her paintings, make a new will, and get on a boat for the Dutch colony of Suriname with her younger daughter, Dorothy, who was 21 years old and interested in boats herself. The colonists didn't quite know what to make of Maria since she had no interest in their sugar plantations or their tea parties. She wanted to see their buds. Some of the natives helped her and her daughter travel around and collect specimens. The petals of this flower change color during the day, which is why she shows the transition from white to pink in the painting. She also shows the male butterfly the female butterfly, and then in the text, she makes sure to mention that they come from the same looking caterpillar. So all of her paintings were like this, told the whole story. But the climate was harshly hot and humid, and Maria contracted yellow fever or malaria or maybe both, and had to cut her collecting journey short. In 1701, she returned to Amsterdam with all her specimens, notes, and drawings. The list of her cargo included a crocodile, a large variety of snakes, and 20 round boxes with butterflies, beetles, hummingbirds, and glowworms. Some of the specimens were pressed, some were preserved in brandy, and in order to pay for publishing her most famous book, she eventually ended up having to sell all of her specimens. In 1705, she published both a Latin and a Dutch edition of her masterwork, Metamorphoses Insectorum Surinamensium, or The Transformation of the Insects of Suriname. It was an enormous sensation. She achieved great fame throughout Europe, but she was widely criticized for her unfeminine studies and travels during her lifetime and beyond. For example, consider this passage from a book called Natural History for Children, <coughs> published 75 years after her death. The book is written in the style of a dialogue. I will show our nephews, nieces, and cousins the illustration and description in the book of Miss Mary. You will greatly oblige them by communicating the work of this lady, who undertook quite a journey to search for insects in that hot country. I would not like to go away on such a journey. It should also be considered as something peculiar that a lady ventures on going to countries so full of noxious animals. However, she has acquired much praise. Sir, I admit this, that I myself would rather do without the ample praise of a femme savant for the praise of a modest and experienced housekeeper, which is more proper to our sex and possibly of greater use. And I choose the knowledge of insects and of natural history only for distraction, because I have observed that one gets entangled in the endless objects to such an extent that one loses sight of civilian utility in society. <laughs> Dear lady, you are judging very wisely, because although this science provides many benefits, it costs time and experience. And if one devotes oneself to it entirely, one has to neglect household duties, absolutely. <laughs> Despite all the criticism, her pioneering work has stood the test of time, and scientists have honored her by naming for her at least six plants, nine butterflies, two bugs, one spider, and a very large New World lizard. During her lifetime, she recorded and illustrated the life cycles of 186 insect species. Germany honored her by placing her portrait and an example of her work on the 500 George Martin Bill in 1991. And these commemorative stamps were issued by the United States Post Office in 1997. The other 
woman artist whose name is on the wall of the gallery is Elizabeth Blackwell. Elizabeth was born about 10 years before Maria Sibylla Marion died. Her family was an affluent one in Evan in Scotland. And Elizabeth was educated to read and write as well as paint. But when she eloped with her second cousin, Alexander, her family disowned her. <laughs> Alexander was a bright, well-educated, and slightly shifty character. While living in Aberdeen with Elizabeth, he gained respect working as a physician. When it came out that he had no formal medical training, however, the couple was forced to flee to London. There, he explored a new profession. Staying true to his character, Alexander established a printing house without bothering with any of the prerequisites, like serving an apprenticeship or joining a guild. He was charged with violating the trade rules and slapped with heavy fines. Forced to close shop, the couple could not afford the penalties and Alexander landed in debtor's prison. Elizabeth, ever loyal and refusing to despair, needed a solution. Almost 200 years after Fuchs' purple, the time was right in London for a new one. With so many new plants coming over the ocean from the Americas, all people could talk about was how England needed a new hermit. Well, Elizabeth heard me. She knew how to paint. She recognized a great opportunity to illustrate an updated herbal describing these new plants. The problem was she had no botanical or medical knowledge. Conveniently, she happened to know a bright, well-educated fellow who wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> so working with specimens from the Chelsea Physic Garden, Elizabeth created drawings that she would hand over to her husband in prison. And he would provide descriptions and names in several languages. By selling subscriptions of four illustrations and one page of text every week for two years, Elizabeth created the final product of a two-volume collection titled A Curious Herbal, containing 500 cuts of the most useful plants, which are now used in the practice of physics, to which is added a short description of the new plants and their common uses in physics. She um, got the endorsement of the Royal College of Physicians, and she sold enough of these that she could pay off all of Alexander's debts and got him out of prison. And here is Elizabeth Blackwell's dragon plant. But Alexander was a man of consistency, and after his release, he quickly entangled himself in more unsuccessful business ventures. His debts reaccumulated until Elizabeth was forced to sell some of her publication rights just to keep food on the table. Vowing to improve their situation, Alexander set sail to Sweden in 1742 to carry out agricultural experiments. His successes inspired him to become a doctor again, <laughs> this time as court physician to Sweden's King Frederick I. <laughs> I regret to report that Alexander's boldness in politics matched his record in business. He involved himself in a conspiracy over the royal line of succession to the Swedish throne and landed in prison, this time as a traitor. He proclaimed his innocence on the scaffold, then knelt, laid his head on the chopping block, the wrong way. <laughs> and when his error was pointed out, he responded, I'm sorry for the mistake, but this is the first time I've been beheaded. <laughs> All that's known about the rest of Elizabeth's life is that she died in 1758. The plant genus Blackwellia is named for her. In this exuberant age of discovery and expansion, there have been occasional warnings about the human animal's effect on nature. In 1640, Isaac Walton had written The Complete Angler, extolling the virtues of sport fishing. In 1662, John England had spoken at the Royal Society about forest and timber management. In 1690, Governor William Penn required all Pennsylvania settlers to preserve one acre of trees for every five acres cleared. And in 1739, Benjamin Franklin and his followers began a 30-year crusade to attempt to regulate industrial waste pollution, uh, industrial waste disposal, and the water pollution that ensued in Philadelphia. But over
overall, the new world was seen as having unlimited resources of commodities and wildlife, and many humans felt the need to grow rich from them. Naturalists, though, were preoccupied with identifying, naming, and classifying all these animals and plants never seen before by Europeans. Englishman Mark Hasty was one of these naturalists. His book came out roughly 30 years after Meredith's Suriname book, and at about the same time as Elizabeth Blackwell's Curious Herbal. His title was The Natural History of the Carolinas, Florida, and Bahama Islands, and it was based on four years of travel and study in the colony. Hasty was one of the first to show birds and other animals in their natural surroundings, which he learned from studying a famous book about Suriname. He even dissected birds to examine their stomach contents to make sure he showed the right plants with the right birds. He was one of the first to describe bird migration. Now this may not sound important, but before Casey, people believed that birds hibernated over winter in hollow trees or under the ice in the mud at the bottom of ponds. He was also among the first to recognize that destruction of a species' habitat leads to extinction. And Casey's book includes at least four species now extinct or nearly extinct. The heath hen, the ivory-billed woodpecker, which there may have been some recent sightings of, the Carolina parakeet, which we have a beautiful painting of the Carolina parakeet in the gallery by Audubon, mm -hmm. and the passenger pigeon. Jumping forward 100 years, the next one in our gallery, who was willing to sound alarms in his writings about human impact on nature, was a name we all know, John James Audubon. But you may not realize, that was not always his name. It was his third name. He was born in 1785 on the island we now know as Haiti, to a chambermaid at his father's sugar plantation. And there it is on the map. You can just barely see where it says Audubon. And his mother named him Jean Rebin. When she died less than a year later, Capitan Audubon ordered the housekeeper to take over raising the baby boy. And when the slave rebellion took place in 1791, Capitan Audubon chose the two lightest skinned of his many mixed race children with the intent to send them to France for his wife to raise. To legally immigrate and be adopted by the Audubons, the children needed new names. So Jean Rebin became Jean Jacques Fougere Audubon when he was six years old. Not only did his name change, but his life changed. He was given the education worthy of a wealthy merchant's son, which included lessons in art, music, and natural history. He grew particularly fascinated with birds and was soon using his artistic abilities to sketch them on a regular basis. At age 12, his father was Steve Jackson sent Jean-Jacques to military school, hoping that he would follow in his papa's footsteps in the French Navy. But the poor boy was so seasick, he could barely function. So he was expelled from military school and returned to his beloved country home. And this is what that same house looks like today. When he turned 18, Jean-Jacques became eligible to be drafted into Napoleon's military. At the town, Audubon came to the rescue one more time. He evidently knew some shady characters because he was able to buy a passport for his son with the new name John James Audubon, and the young man successfully dodged the draft and sailed to New York City. Young Audubon parlayed those same skills in storytelling to become an entrepreneur. For example, when it came time to find a publisher for his masterpiece, Birds of America, he got nothing but rejections in the United States. He left America despondent because he could not find a publisher for his book. So on the boat to England, he grew out his hair and he decked himself out in a full frontier costume. When he disembarked in Liverpool, he was the talk of the town. With his unusual appearance, his tall tales about hanging out with Daniel Boone, and his stunning artwork of the American birds. 
and he found plenty of English subscribers for his book that he got down to work. What you may not realize is that Audubon did not do all the work himself. He always traveled with a crew, a taxidermist, and at least one other painter. In 1831, he had just arrived in Charleston, South Carolina, to study more birds for volume two. And he happened to meet a Lutheran minister literally on the street named John Bachman. Bachman was also an amateur naturalist, and his wife Harriet was chronically ill and unable to care for their eight children on her own. So Harriet's sister, Maria Martin, had come to live with the family and run the household. Bachman was so excited to meet Audubon that he insisted the whole birdie party come stay at his house instead of a boarding house. And this is a photo of his home where he invited Audubon to come and stay. So for the next several weeks, Audubon's team brought nearly 400 dead birds to Bachman's house. The taxidermist stuffed them, posed them, and then Audubon and the painter worked on sketching and painting. Modest Maria managing eight children, a sick sister, a house full of guests, and now knee-deep in dead birds, finally mentioned that she knew a little bit about painting. And this is uh, one of her paintings. It's now in the Charleston Museum. It, you can see it got damaged by fire. Within six months, Maria Martin had begun painting backgrounds of plants and insects for Audubon. Now, one of the few mentions that Audubon makes of Maria was in Birds of America. And this is Maria's woodpecker, and I'll read you what he says about her. In honoring this species with the name of Miss Maria Martin, I cannot refrain from intimating the respect, admiration, and sincere friendship which I feel towards her. And stating that, independently of her other accomplishments and our mutual goodwill, I feel bound to make some ornithological acknowledgment of, for the aid she has on several occasions afforded me in embellishing my drawings of birds by adding to them beautiful and correct representations of plants and flowers. As it turns out, this bird was not a separate species, but it was a nice thought. <laughs> Maria painted both of these backgrounds. When Sister Harriet finally passed away, Maria married her brother-in-law and became Maria Martin Bachman. John Bachman remained Audubon's lifelong friend and one of his main bird collectors. Maria went on to illustrate other scientific works, including her own husband's, until she fell and broke her elbow in 1840. As I said, she painted both of these backgrounds. This Bachman warbler here on the right was named for John Bachman, and the tree is no longer found in the wild, although it is still in cultivation, and it's called Franklinia alakamaha, which was named to honor Benjamin Franklin. 26 years before Audubon's birth, an amazingly talented painter of botanicals was born in Belgium. Pierre Joseph Rebité was the son and grandson of famous painters, so he was trained as a painter, and through some very lucky introductions, he ended up as the royal painter for Queen Marie Antoinette, and later for the Empress Josephine. Although things were pretty crazy in France during the Revolution, Queen Marie Antoinette was so impressed with Rebité's talent that she insisted he keep on painting, even while she was in prison. The legend goes that the Queen had Rebité come to see her in prison because a rare night-blooming cactus was about to bloom, and she wanted to make sure this beautiful moment was captured in the painting. And this is a painting that he made of the night-blooming period. During the 1790s, Rebité gained international recognition as one of the most popular flower painters in the world. He was a celebrity. He had a fashionable clientele. He had a private apartment in the Louvre. He had a country residence outside of Paris. And his salary was $200,000 in today's money a year. So let's tie some of these people together. In 1828, Audubon went to Paris and visited Rebité in his studio. And, and Rebité gave Audubon some of his artwork. The 
later, Audubon wrote in a letter to his wife back in America, Now, my Lucy, this will be a great treat for thee, fond of flowers as thou art. When thou seest these, thine eyes will feast on the finest you can imagine. That's a pretty nice present to take home to your wife. <laughs> Reynolds Hay was equally impressed with Audubon. Although he later subscribed to Birds of America, in 1828 he was having financial troubles and could not afford his new friend's paintings, so they worked on a trade. And Audubon left Reddy Hay's studio with several prints in hand and a promise that Reddy Hay would ship him a copy of his famous book of rose paintings. And with resources like these prints, Audubon had at his disposal incomparable teaching aids. And it's known that Maria Martin improved her own paintings by copying those prints for practice and for study. Let's mention one more woman artist whose work is in the gallery, but her name is barely visible. John Gould came from a humble British family. It's probable that after some slight education, he served with his father as a gardener and thus became attracted to both plants and birds. At 23, he was appointed a taxidermist on the staff of the Zoological Society of London, and one of his taxidermy colleagues had a sister, Elizabeth Coxon. John's career in ornithology was on the rise at the time of his and Elizabeth's wedding. By 1828, he had been appointed curator and preserver at the Museum of the Zoological Society of London. And in 1830, a collection of Himalayan bird skins came across his desk for preservation. His colleague was in the process of describing them. And Gould had heard about a new printing technology called lithography. So he put forward a proposal for an illustrated book to show off the new and interesting species contained in the collection. Fully aware that his own artistic abilities were not up to the task, John brought the project to his pregnant bride, Elizabeth, who at first did not grasp the gravity of her husband's request. But who will do the plates on stone, she reportedly asked. Why, you, of course, John replied. The beautiful lithographs produced by Elizabeth Gould show lively birds of all shapes and colors performing mating displays, protecting the young, and interacting with their environment. I'm sorry to say that even though Elizabeth lithographed all 80 plates for a century of birds from the Himalayan mountains, and all 50 plates for the birds volume of the Zoology of the Voyage of the HMS Beagle, only the name of her husband, John, appears on the title pages. Tragically, Elizabeth Gould died in 1841 from postpartum sepsis following the birth of her eighth child, Sarah. At the time of her death, Elizabeth had composed, lithographed, and painted designs for 84 plates of the birds of Australia. The remainder of the work was done by teams of artists hired after her death, and all of their work was based on her sketches paintings, and notes. During an 11-year career, Elizabeth Gould designed, lithographed, and painted more than 650 plates. John Gould, throughout his life, never objected to being credited as an amazing illustrator of the birds of the world, even going so far as to remove another artist's name from images before publication. From the very beginning, Elizabeth was an essential component in the Gouldian enterprise. And in remembrance of her efforts at her death, John Gould named one of the most beautiful Australian species of finch after her by writing this in the book. It was with feelings of the purest affection that I ventured to dedicate this lovely bird to the memory of my late wife, who for many years laboriously assisted me with her pencil, accompanied me to Australia, and cheerfully interested herself in all my pursuits. <laughs> How ironic that the name most people associate with this pretty bird is that of John Gould, a ornithologist and fine print producer, rather than its intended honoree, the talented but obscured zoological artist Elizabeth Gould. I am happy to say that the magpie in the gallery was painted 
and Linda Brandt by Elizabeth Gould. And if you look closely, you will see her name. Well, I hope you've enjoyed these anecdotes about the images in the gallery. In looking at these exquisite artworks, it's amazing to realize what these people sacrificed in order to create them. Some of them were stubbornly obsessed with learning about the world around them. Some of them just wanted to be remembered after their own death. Some of them did it because they loved another person. All of them wanted to teach me and you something profound about natural history. So, this flower is in the gallery. The first person who tells me who the painter is gets a quarter. <laughs> Thank you for coming tonight. <laughs>